to HIV, LPFM in New Orleans. We are Radio NOLA HIV with programming dedicated to human rights and social justice. WHIVFM.org, we honor independent voices. We are not a radio station with a mission. Nope, we are a station. We are a mission with a radio station and all wars. Uh, it's uh, You are listening and watching the Noise Filter Daily Hour Long Show. My name is Dr. Mark Allendary, and sitting across the digital divide is my friend and yours. That's Dr. Eric Griggs. Say hi, Dr. Griggs. Hi, Dr. Griggs. <laughs> How are you doing today, Dr. Griggs? I'm good. I'm good. Good. It's uh, TGI Friday, but today's really Tuesday. <laughs> Uh, with us today is a, a good friend of mine, uh, somebody that I've known for many years, uh, uh, and that is Ed Fallon, uh, who is a climate activist, a recovering politician, who was in the State House uh, in Iowa for 14 years, and also is the host of his own talk show called The Fallon Forum uh, that is syndicated, is actually run on WHIV. You can find more information about Ed Fallon at FallonForum.com. Ed, welcome to uh, Noise Filter, uh, the Daily Hour Long Show. How are you? Great to be here, and I'm doing well. We just enjoyed uh, two 60-degree days up here in Iowa, and now it's back to normal. What's the uh, COVID situation right now in, in Iowa? Um, not as bad as it was, but there's some expectation that it might get worse again, that, that, that uh, there's been enough, enough um, bad planning that uh, we might see another surge, but that's probably the case everywhere, I think, isn't it? I, I think so. Was there was a, your governor? I think was uh, a little bit of a, was somewhat uh, blasé, or didn't quite believe in the science, or was slow to mandate masks. Yes, yeah, she well, she was. Um, it, it was kind of a, a a jerky reaction, just kind of not quite sure what to do. On again, off again. Let's open some businesses. Let's close these. Let's you know. It was. Um, she hasn't gotten many props for for doing a good job with. Um, with managing it. Nothing like Donald Trump, but still not uh, not favorable overall. I don't know whether it's going to affect the uh, 2022 election at all. It might. Some people think it will. I'm not so sure. Uh, is, that, is that when she's running for re-election? Or? She'd be up for re-election in 2022. And uh, right now we haven't had any Democrats uh, declare. They're probably all still recovering from the Iowa caucuses. But uh, <laughs> we'll see what oh, happens. Speaking of which, I was telling this to Eric yesterday. Ed, you have to tell the story. I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Um, it, it's such a great story. Speaking of Iowa caucuses, uh, I was telling Eric yesterday when I was setting you up for uh, joining us. And for those of you that are, are listening, and hello to our Noise Filter family. I see all you guys. Uh, 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 during the uh, primary, uh, 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 Vice President or uh, President elect uh, Biden had a habit of telling people. Um, if they were in a conversation, he would finally end the conversation by saying, well, just go vote for somebody else, right? That was that was his final go-to. Yeah. I am proud to say that Ed Fallon was the <laughs> first person that uh, that Biden said that to and then started a nationwide trend. Well, I, was, I wasn't the first, but I, I was perhaps, a, it was perhaps one of the more um, well-publicized incidents. I, I went to talk to him. Well, I mean, I understand Biden and I go way back. I first met Joe Biden in 1987. He, we both had hair back then, you know, and, uh, yeah, and then actually, yeah, like Griggs. <laughs> tell me about it. Tell me and about actually, it. I, after I ran for I ran for governor in 20, uh, 2006, he and I got together for a beer and a game of pool. I mean, just just us, you know. I'm so we go way back, but um, I'm real I'm real concerned about this Dakota Access pipeline, which we've tried to stop, and now we're trying to stop it from being doubled. And so we've been we were talking to him left and right across the state, not just me, but hundreds of people. And, you know, finally, we haven't really got a clear response. So me and my partner, Kathy, and a couple others went to see him. And um, I said, so, hey, I need to know, really, where you stand on this pipeline? And he just said, yeah, and he just kind of grabbed me by the lapels and poked me a little bit. And you know, it was kind of uncomfortable. You know, he never answered my question. He's, but, a, he's a close talker, right? Yeah, he is a close talker. Uh, he's not a bad pool player, by the way. He beat me at that. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I got to say, uh, you know, despite that, he he came he, he's come a ways on climate I, I think where he's at on climate today and where he was last may when he first announced his campaign and came to iowa he's a, he's a long ways ahead on that and and he's got kamala harris who again is not like a like a massively progressive democrat but she's she gets climate i mean we had some really good interactions with her too and i i mean again compare them with trump pence and we're going to see a lot more hope that we're going to take some solid action on climate than if we went under a second Trump administration. 
But uh, in the end, uh, you got uh, you got told to vote for somebody else. Let me ask you. I don't mean to put you on the spot, and of course, you can tell me it's none of my business. Did you, in the end, vote for somebody else? No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, I, I I told Biden I, I was not gonna. I, I told him right then and there, look, I'm gonna vote for you in the in the general election. All right, all right. And, and I did. He, I kept I kept he, my word. And he clearly <laughs> remembered you, and he he knew who you were and all that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, I, he meets a lot of people. Who knows what he remembers and what he doesn't? But, but yeah, I um, you know, I, it's politics. So I, I, you know, like I told Tom Vilsack earlier this year, I I was going to fight as hard for my candidate in the primary and not you know not pull any punches at all. Uh, but once it was done, I was going to get behind whoever won the nomination. I mean, right. I'm not always I'm not always the guy who will vote for whoever wins the Democratic nomination, if it's a really lousy Democrat and there are other considerations, I might not vote for them. But when you're up against uh, Trump and the continued threat of fascism, it's kind of an easy one. You know? sure. you got to go with you got to go with the person who um, who is going to, in this case, maintain the status quo, which I'm not excited about. But when you compare the status quo with where, where Trump wanted to go, that's a no brainer. Absolutely. And, and and just to kind of round that up, this is something I've been wanting to ask you for a while. You did end up initially endorsing, um, and I can't remember the name of the of the person that you ended up endorsing. Um, Tom but it Steyer. was It was, right, Steyer. And, yeah, and yeah. that was largely due to his commitment to climate, right? Yeah, you know, it was, it was a bit awkward for me to, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support a billionaire. Uh, <laughs> I was but surprised. I, I was surprised when I got that email. I was very surprised. <laughs> but he oh, was, he was, and we after Jay Inslee dropped out. And I mean, and the more you talk to him, I mean, so we got we had Steyer over to our house. He was on my program. Um, we, we got to know his wife and daughter, and he really is a genuine believer in the urgency of climate change. And I think the fact that he has been vocal and, and a big supporter of Biden since the since the primary. That's going to help. His voice in, in the next administration is going to be important. And I'm, I don't regret supporting him at all. But I will say that Kathy and I were the only two at our caucus standing for Steyer. <laughs> <laughs> so that meant we had to uh, reallocate. And I went with Sanders. Kathy went with Warren. Got it. And that, that, that makes sense. <laughs> and by the way, Biden didn't, didn't get a single delegate in our caucus. <laughs> really? No yeah. kidding. Wow. <laughs> That was despite having Vilsack uh, stumping for him across the state. All right. All right. I, I said one last question. A minute. This is, I promise, last question. Okay. Are, is Iowa going to get rid of caucuses once and for all, or is that going to still be a thing? Iowa won't get rid of the caucuses. We'll cling to them, you know, to our dying breath. But uh, okay. what happened here last year or that last uh, February didn't help us any. I mean, right. I don't know what the heck party officials were thinking about using a untested uh, right new it app. Listen, I'll be honest. It looked like it was a little bit like the fix was in. That's what it seemed like. I don't know if I would agree with that, but I, I, from, from, from from being in New Orleans, mm -hmm. watching it from over there, an mm -hmm. untapped app, and then wasn't it there was there ended up being a connection with the person who got the app with one of the political campaigns with Buttigieg's campaign, and right. Buttigieg and Sanders basically tied in Iowa. Right. No, I I, I don't know. I mean. I, I can see why you think that, and I don't blame you for think that, thinking that, and I can't say for sure that that's not the case, but my gut and my familiarity with the individual players, even though they made some really stupid decisions, I don't think they're bad people. I don't think they screwed up intentionally. I mean, I, Iowa does not want to lose the caucuses. I mean, first of all, it's a lot of fun. Um, we have a, a pretty deep institution here, and it's good for our economy. Just all cards on the table. It's really good. I wish Louis, I wish Louisiana would, would get the get the uh, first of the nation caucuses or primary someday. Um, and actually, honestly, all, all fairness, I think it ought to be rotated. I think there ought to be different small states, maybe four states each 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 round. One in the south, Midwest, Northeast, South that get to um, get to be the lead off, like Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. Let's switch it up. You know, I. It's hard to do that because there really is a foundation to how you pull it all together. Uh, there's a lot of um, a lot of institutional memory that we have going back to the 70s. But that said, I think it'd be fair to mix it up a bit. You guys ought to go first next. I would I would love that. Uh, and nothing would please me more to doing something like that. Doc Griggs, what would you think about that if uh, we were able to do caucuses here? Yeah, in about two or three years when this COVID thing's over, I'm all for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be that long? No okay. crowd. Tell, bro. Me, no. tell me it's spring. Tell me it's done in the spring, please. No, no, no crowd. Yeah, life no. would be that way. I wish it would. No. I, I imagine that it'll be done, done by the next time. The time the coxes roll back around. 
Oh no, yeah. man! I'm gonna, I'm gonna my, go shoot myself. I'm out of here. See you later. <laughs> my, what was my guesstimation? My guesstimation was uh, like in the very beginning. What did I say, Doc Riggs? I said 2022, 2024, right? Yeah, and I thought that was way too far. And now I'm 2024, 25 myself. So what, what I don't, what I understand. Okay, you got a vaccine coming on. I mean, several vaccines coming on. You've got the development of herd immunity. I'm, I'm, you, I'm the only one here who doesn't know anything about medicine. So hey, whatever, for whatever, whatever I say, take it with a grain of salt. But it seems to me like with that happening, we're looking at hopefully the end of this a lot sooner than 2022. No? So I have a question, right? Yeah. Um, so we have a vaccine. Uh, we have a treatment for the flu, right? Right. Right. Well, we have we have we have a flu vaccine that what inoculates against some versions of the flu, but not all. Yeah, so and it's been a hundred years, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. You so mean COVID, COVID, COVID's not going anywhere. We're still in year one. COVID's gonna be around for a long time. Um, I think the vaccines are gonna do, work really well towards uh, developing of herd immunity artificially. Um, but I think we have a much larger task at hand dealing with the changing of social behaviors um, and all of the dismantling and, and, and all of the weaponization, politicization, the vilifying of science, the discrediting of science, um, all of that before we can get anything uh, close to comfortable where everything, like you said before, works. Whether you agree with the system or not, it gets back to a system that we recognize and can control. That's one of the issues. So uh, viruses are going to do what they do. Um, and again, uh, when when H1N1 came around 100 years ago, we didn't even know what a virus was. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, in 1918, you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, 1918, yeah. Well, let, let me ask this. At what point did we stop uh, shutting down the country? At what, at what point did we don't, no longer have to do that anymore? With COVID. Well, I think, I think so. So if you're talking to us as scientists, uh, there's no point. As a scientist, uh, the, the biggest thing to do is move everyone out of the way of the danger. And I don't care it doesn't, if you look worried about public safety. Now, but, but, pay, people, but pay people to stay at home. No, no, no. no, no. I'm, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm not bringing in economics. I'm just bringing okay. in this whole $500,000 of debt that I got into. That everyone's saying is a bunch of crap all of a sudden because one guy with a two people with a microphone say the doctors and scientists don't know what they're talking about. Well, just from the that little basic process is that you move people out of way out of harm's way, uh, and then you get into the real world of it, oh, economically, policy wise, and all that, that that other stuff. The safest thing to do would be for everyone to go in and move away, so if this thing would stop stop propagating in the community. That's not practical. We learn that. Uh, it's injurious to the economy, mentally, socially. So moving forward, I think there'll be other things, hopefully, put in place, and that's what Mark Allen talked about, just staying economically sound and afloat while we get through this thing, um, being strategic and surgical about it, having a national policy from the top down, one uniform list and way of dealing with everything, but using the, these things, the tools in our bag strategically so it doesn't feel like punishment. Mark Allen? Absolutely. Ed, you got somebody here from, sorry, one of our noise uh, filter family members who asking you, when will you run for political office again? So uh, that's, uh, I, I think that- um, when, the cow, when the cows come home. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have a message here from Judge, uh, Judge Johnson. He says, so I'm nine years over 65. With old black man issues, where can I get in line for the shot? Judge Johnson, I'm right there with you. Uh, we'll be talking about that in just a moment. It, it's expected that the FDA will approve this either tonight because Dr. Han just got his job threatened that if he didn't approve it tonight, he will be fired. I was uh, just about to say that. Did you see that? One across it, the it, it's, it's, it's in the rundown. I got it in the rundown. So. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Judge Johnson, it's it's likely that you're going to be in probably in the one, um, like the with what they refer to as the one B or the two A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, first goes healthcare providers, um, and then um, uh, nursing home residents. Uh, then after that, it's going to be uh, uh, folks that are that that are like you, Judge Johnson, which is going to be very much like those that are elderly. Um, with uh, chronic health conditions. Obviously, I don't know if you have chronic health conditions, but just you being uh, uh, nine years over 65, uh, I would say so. Uh, yes, and that works. Judge Johnson, 
has a show on WHIV and is an amazing, amazing awesome. person. Uh, and Ed, you would, you would, you should meet Judge Johnson, and you should have him on your show. Uh, a, a tremendous person. I'm happy to talk about that. In, yeah, I love in, that. That'd be great. Uh, so let's just go ahead and just jump. Uh, today, I, I presented uh, data to the uh, mayor's office uh, as I do on Fridays and as I like to share with you guys. And so let me share with you what I thought were the uh, relevant uh, 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 the relevant uh, articles uh, 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 or notable uh, facts uh, for the day. Uh, so we're at 71 million uh, and 70,927 cases globally with 1,594,772 deaths uh, um, total. Look at this, Doc Riggs. We are now new cases. We are averaging. Remember, it was we were at five hundred thousand. Yeah, now we're almost at seven hundred thousand. So we are we are getting to a million cases almost every day and a half now. Six hundred eighty-four thousand seven hundred twenty-nine new cases. That was yesterday, and then we also had new deaths. Was twelve thousand six hundred ninety-one. Doc Riggs, look at this. Look how many people. Eight point eight people died per minute. So let's round up. Nine people <clears throat> died per minute in the past 24 hours. 540 people an hour. That was all uh, as a result of COVID. Um, this is what it looks like globally. Here's our first wave, here's our second wave. And then, wow, are we seeing tremendous exponential growth. For a moment, we thought that this was gonna be a plateau. Unfortunately, we are seeing a continuing increase in cases. Uh, over the course of 14 days, it's been 7%. Um, and then unfortunately, mortality continues to go up. And of course, mortality is gonna continue to go up because it's a two week lagging indicator. So as you get more cases, and if you look at, if you just take a 1% mortality rate, if you get more cases, you're gonna get more, at 1% mortality, you're gonna just end up seeing more mortality, uh, uh, more deaths, and this graph shows this very nicely. Uh, we are seeing more deaths, and you can see about a week and a half ago, we had a, a record number of deaths, but just yesterday that is quickly approaching. So we are seeing a significant amount of uh, morbidity and mortality. This is looking at the globe. This is a new version of the Doc Riggs. I wanted to show you something interesting. This is looking at hot spots. So I'm going to point out the two hot spots that really stand out: the U.S. and Sweden. And Sweden, whoa. Right, oh, not just the natural herd immunity, Sweden. Oh no! <laughs> I thought you would appreciate Ooh, that. What? Right. So it, the the two hot spots on the globe, just to show you again, the two hot spots on the globe are the U.S. and Sweden. <laughs> Holy smokes, Batman! Wow. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so just to give everybody an idea, that's what we talk about herd immunity. That's what you talk about. We're looking at uh, an uncontrolled uh, number of cases. All right, but let's look at the U.S. Uh, we're at 16,103,202. Number of deaths are 300,592. Yesterday, uh, last night, we added here in the U.S. 217,779 cases. Think about this, guys. That's one third of the total global cases, right? And then we added almost 3,000 deaths last night, which is about one fourth of the total global cases. And unfortunately, two Americans died per minute in the past 24 hours. Um, and much love and peace to those families. Look at our, our curve again. Uh, you can see there's been an increase in 28% over 14 days, an incredibly steep curve. Uh, uh, exponential growth. If you ever want an example of what doubling looks like every couple days, uh, this is about as good an example as you're going to get. It looked like it was starting to fall, uh, but then of course Thanksgiving happened, and then now we're seeing a rocketing, a skyrocketing of cases. Uh, it almost seems like every day we're constantly beating out uh, a couple days prior. Uh, so uh, uh, again, uh, we haven't even started to see the peak of Thanksgiving. We're going to see it come to here. And then like I would mentioned yesterday, what's going to happen is that there may be a little bit of a dip, but then what's going to come after that? Oh, Christmas time. And we'll see increases in cases. Uh, so, so, just a quick math lesson. Um, this slope, the slope is the x-axis over the y-axis. The slope of this curve, if you can go back to it, is starting to approach 90 degrees, which is a straight line, folks. 
Yep. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And in That's fact, do you, remember, do you remember Doc Griggs when North Dakota and South Dakota had those like vertical increases? It was a straight line, straight up. Um, and Ed, feel free to jump in, ask questions, like, you know, comment or whatever. Like this is- well, I was gonna say, uh, the, these graphs look a lot like the graphs I've seen relevant to climate change. Uh, loss oh. of sea ice, uh, global temperature, wow. increase in, uh, you know, in, in severe uh, storms, increase in, in fire hazards out west. Uh, you look a lot, lot familiar, that, it looks very familiar that way. Yeah. So you, you mean to tell me there's a correlation in nature between everything natural? You mean like when we all went inside worldwide, we had 75% of the globe that was on some, some type of lockdown and the climate changed, the smog disappeared from California, the weather was beautiful. You mean you mean there's you mean it's all connected? This whole man versus nature thing actually is it's, it's a thing? Holy smoke. Well that, that wasn't what I was saying, but I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, you, just, you just totally put a bunch of words in my mouth. You should be a politician. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, that's very funny because he's the least political person you'll ever know. yeah. I'm the one that yeah. does politics. He's yeah. the one that does not yeah. like politics. And you get physically shut down when he, when he starts this thing, he'll start it. And I'm just like, <laughs> no, Ed, it's actually a good point because one thing that I've often said, and I've told this to Doc Griggs all the time, we've said it here on Noise Filter, is that I have felt more united with my climate change scientists, brothers and sisters as a result of COVID because, because we are like, here it is, here's the information, do something, do something, people are gonna get hurt. And they're like, doo, 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 doo. and you know, and, and, and uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and in April, yeah, this, that's not real, this, it's fake data. You know, it's, it's smoking's not bad for you. You know, it's all of that, it's all of that stuff. And, uh, and, I, and I was feeling like I now understand what these climate uh, scientists must be experiencing when they're like, here's the data, here's the science, now do something about it. And they're like, doop, 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 you know? no, that's not real, you made it up. That's not real, that's not real. So where, the, where does that come from? I mean, you know, you don't, you, look, I still, I still do know a couple flat earth earthers, okay? But, but still, there are many people who deny the uh, theory of gravity. I mean, you're not, you're not gonna test that by jumping off a building, but, um, why is it that some of the new elements of science are so uh, so questioned? I mean, I know I know that there, are, there is science that's still working through theories and whatnot, but yeah, you, when it comes to climate or 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 disease, I, I know you're doing this thing that means money, right? Yeah, so but, yeah, where, where's the money? In the, where's the money in COVID denial? And I'll tell you something though, like I I, I, I believe it's 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 it, there's money, of course, but I've discovered something that I never in all these years finishing med school residency way back in the 90s that I didn't believe existed. There's a, there are levels of denial that go beyond cognitive dissonance and just outright denial. There are people in this in the current climate that we're in, if you, if we, if one of us were to go on TV and start talking about the theory of gravity, there were people that would jump off buildings. I do believe people would jump out, off of trees, out of houses, just to say, no, you can't tell me not to do that. No, you're wrong. I don't care what your science is. That's an apple that dropped on the ground. That's not me. That's not true. Absolutely. I think we've been vilified and things have been so politicized, weaponized that, I mean, anything we say, they just don't believe. And so it hurts. So I, I understand I, with, with climate change, you know, the oil industry, they want to perpetuate denial. Right. What, why, why COVID? I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain. It, it's because it, it, it was a bad look for Trump. It all started at the top, right? Fish rots from the head down, right? So it was because there was a there was one my the goofy side of me says he doesn't like to wear a mask because it's going to rub off his orange makeup. That's the that's the child side of me coming out. The the, the more serious side of me coming out says um, that uh, that it just was not. He just didn't want to spook the. He knew what was happening. He just had this idea that it's not going to happen. Um, this magical thinking where we all knew this was going to happen. He didn't want to spook the uh, the stock markets and, and the markets, and he also wanted to be reelected. So this was all a bad look. And then as a result of that, all of that just trickled down. So that that's at, that's the way I see it. And so I agree with you. It's not necessarily money, but it is the same thing. It's it's just it's following the leader, and the dear leader didn't want to wear masks and did not want to believe that COVID was real. I mean, did you, I'm sure you know that uh, the Secretary of State's having you know hundreds of people. 
uh, over for these uh, Christmas parties unmasked. These are just going to be more super spreading events. Mm -hmm. yeah, but even, even along those same lines, Ed, like talking about what we were talking about earlier, pressure from the White House to for the FDA to to go ahead and approve this thing helps to erode public trust. It's this out. This, remember that scientific, that expensive science project in education we were talking about. So you got the same stuff happening now when we almost get a potential solution. Hurry up, just so I can get credit for doing it. And it just erodes public trust. It looks like you're in cahoots with some political agenda as opposed to, no, we're trying to make sure that this thing is safest for the general public. Like it's just, I just, I feel like I'm trapped in a, a nightmare version, like a, a Freddy Krueger version of Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is largely we've been we've been talking about oh, this for so long. But heading back to to our slides again, you see that uh, cases are going up. But look at mortalities going up, and then of course the big story is all over the country. Hospitalizations um, are going up, and again here you can see uh, significant mortality going up. We're now reaching mortalities that were higher than the beginning of the first wave. Remember. The first wave here, we didn't even know how to treat. The idea of dexamethasone didn't exist. Remdesivir, uh, there was, everybody was put on ventilators here, and this is why we see this mortality. Then you see that it got better during this time because we knew as doctors how to treat it, but now you're seeing, now we know how to treat this effectively, but because we're, again, 1% mortality rate, the more people who are getting infected, at least 1% of them are gonna die and this is what you're seeing here increases. And now we have officially surpassed the amount of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of cases that, of mortality that was happening uh, during the first wave. And it, of course, this is something that's uh, really quite uh, so, so, problematic. So Go ahead. another reason that, that we're seeing, and I know specifically of the two instances um, where it sadly has happened to people that I know, that you're seeing mortality go up. Part of the reason there was such a spike before is people at the very beginning, we did know what, not know what this was. People would get sick. They'd be afraid to go to the hospitals. Um, a, they couldn't get in because the hospitals were overwhelmed. And B, they were afraid because the one place that they knew COVID resided was at the hospital. So what's happening now is you're getting people, you're in the middle of cold, flu, respiratory virus season. People are getting the cough. They're getting sick. They're afraid to go to the hospital because the numbers are going up. There's no room for them if they can. And I know of at least two men, and I know that in the community, guys that will get a cough and get sick, and they'll stay at home until the very, very last minute uh, to go to the hospital. And because of this, this new type of um, golly, this new, new type of dissociation of oxygen from the hypoxia, this dissociation of hypoxia, um, they'll get worse and worse and not feel really, really bad. But by then, the pneumonia's gotten to the point where it's too late. In the midst of, of, of countrywide panic, while the numbers are here, before we were starting numbers here, now we're starting from this, this plateau up here where people are going to die anyway. So there's a lot that we're dealing with right now. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, it does. And, 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 and what you're describing is a good point is that you know, what, what Doc Griggs was describing it is that um, it's this fascinating medical, uh, it, it, this new, the way that this pneumonia works is that even though your blood oxygen levels are low, you're actually doing okay. Even yeah. though, whereas in the past, if your blood oxygen level fell below 88%, you're like, mm. you know, but some of these oxygen levels are at 75, 80% or, you know, and, and people are just, they're just like, doop, doop, doop. You know, there, really? are, there are cases where they've asked, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, can you get off the phone? We need to intubate you. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, no. Uh, so, but yeah, the hospitalizations obviously have been going up and, uh, or I'm sorry, mortality has been going up. And this is certainly, uh, 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 is problematic. And, and we're going to see more of this. We are going to be seeing more 9-11s every day, probably now uh, through uh, the end of December through January and possibly into February. This is a, uh, a, a disaster. Uh, usually the next slide, Ed, these are slides I showed the mayors. Usually the next slide I show are slides looking at um, military deaths. Um, and we've surpassed uh, World War I. And now uh, next is uh, World War II, which is at uh, 500,000, uh, 400,000 deaths. So 
So we're going to be reaching that. And the other thing that's super scary about this too, if you think about it, is that the 1918 influenza epidemic killed 500,000 Americans. 500, we didn't even know what a virus was in those days, right? So now we're at a point where we could, we're within striking distance of, of, uh, of being able to reach the 1918 levels of mortality. And yet we're a hundred years later and supposedly far more sophisticated. So let me ask you about the 1918 uh, Spanish flu, the influenza. What, um, what eventually led, led to the point where that was no longer a concern? I mean, I think I, I would imagine that was probably to a certain degree, those that were infected probably died. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, and oh. then those, and then those that survived. Uh, so there was just a natural form of, uh, of a, of a herd like immunity, although that is not a term, that's a term that's usually um, exists to describe vaccinations, but it just petered out because it just affected everybody that it could affect. What's the, what's the difference between uh, herd immunity and herd like immunity? <laughs> that was my, that was my made up word. Uh, because okay. We, because because, I, because herd immunity has become a word that's been somewhat bastardized. Yeah. It was always meant to be talked about it in the setting of a vaccine. Period. And that was it. So in 1918, I say herd like immunity because there was no vaccine back then. But it, what it did is it just it 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 picked off enough of the population or and or infected the rest that the virus couldn't sustain itself anymore. So enough people developed immunity, and perhaps also the human, uh, the, the, our our bodies developed resistance to to the um, to the uh, disease. Is well, it was probably behavior that at that point. The people were dying very dramatically, and so there was there was just a lot more. Even though there was some mask hesitancy then, there was a lot more in those days, a hundred years ago. This whole sense of like individual liberties. There was no internet. People weren't like spreading these ideas that could go viral. Uh, Rush Limbaugh hadn't been invented. Rush yet. Limbaugh had not been invented. His medium had not been invented either. So, and so I think people were a little bit more, America was more of a we society instead of a me society. So and, and just, to, just to mildly correct the statement uh, and the line of thinking, um, enough people, enough people died basically to the point that the virus, enough people died, the balance between dead and already infected normalized and the virus just petered out. Like that's, that's why that's the irony of seeing Sweden at the top of the hot spots in the world, because, you know, everyone talked about this bastardized term herd immunity um, in, in the natural world. And they don't realize how many people have to die for that to happen. There were 50 million people that died. Is it 50 million that or was it more? Was it uh, of uh, globally? Worldwide, globally, worldwide, it was 50, 50 million, million right? Globally. globally. Yeah, 50 yeah. million people globally died for it to peter out. No one wants to sign up. I don't want to be part of that crew or yeah. anyone I know to be a part of that. Everyone wants to talk about it until it's time. Right. Absolutely. Uh, if you're tuned in, uh, you we you are listening to Coist, uh, Noise Filter. With us today is uh, Ed Fallon, recovering politician, climate activist, and also a talk show host of the Fallon Forum. He's in Des Moines, Iowa, but his show is syndicated uh, even here on WHIV, which plays on Friday mornings. You can find more information about Ed at FallonForum.com. Uh, real quickly before we go on, let me just answer a quick question here from Mignon. Is there any proof showing that those who were infected with the Spanish flu suffered from health issues uh, due to being infected? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, the, uh, so I, I think the question you're asking is, was there long-term effects of, of it, sort of like what we're seeing here? I am certain there was, but it's not been very well documented. What they did do is they ended up having people who died of influenza in 1918 ended up dying from a secondary pneumonia. In other words, what happened was that the influenza pneumonia itself cleared out the natural, uh, they're called cilia. Uh, they're the protective uh, mechanism the lungs use to constantly brush debris and viruses and bacteria out of the lungs that cilia got completely denuded, much like a forest would be denuded after uh, you know, a, a, a fire or what have you. So without any of that protection the there- folks means wiped out, folks. Yeah, wiped right. out. The, the cilia beat like this to move stuff out, they're just like dead trees. So, um, so what ended up happening is that because Staph aureus is everywhere, 
Um, people were, and, and, and staff hadn't even been discovered by then. These are, this is presumptive thinking that people were dying of staph aureus uh, infections uh, uh, at that point. Uh, actually, that's not true. Actually, they, they did have, um, they did have uh, gram positive, they were aware of gram positive cocci and they are able to look back now and recognize it as, as staph aureus. So that's how people died uh, in 1918 uh, uh, of in droves. In droves. Right. Matthew asked a great question about percentage, what would the numbers be today? I don't know off the top of my head, I would just have to do the math on that one, but that's a, that's a great question. Um, and then uh, uh, it's like a hurricane tree, absolutely. Here, uh, Matthew uh, Wilkinson, uh, old friend of mine, pharmacist of Palomine, we uh, have certainly seen a spike in the number of ICU patient relative to COVID-19 in the multitude of hospitals I'm on staff at. Again, uh, uh, Matthew is a, is a doctor of pharmacology. Uh, we continue to treat vented patients with fentanyl drips. That's an opioid, Nimbex, ketamine, uh, and uh, Prisidex infusion. So these are all medications that are meant to kind of like basically sedate people and keep them calm. Remdesivir and Acterma are sparingly used. Remdesivir is the, um, uh, is the uh, drug that shortens the length. And I think Acterma, is that, dex is that another word for dexamethasone? I'm not familiar with that. I'm not familiar with that one. Yeah, what's interesting is that there's almost no mention of influence or pneumonia diagnosis or influenza or pneumonia diagnosis. The issue of billing uh, PIC, uh, and reimbursement issues, maybe inflating actual case numbers. Yeah, Matthew, that's a, I, right off the top of my head, it's hard for me to follow exactly what you're saying, but um, this is definitely something that's interesting and I would love to be able to chat with you. We haven't, we, we definitely need to have a phone call. Uh, we haven't caught up in some, some time. I would love to catch up and, and, yeah, I'm and chat. I'm not familiar with what, what, what PIC is, intensive, personal, intensive, right. patient intensive care, I guess, I don't know. Um, anyway, so okay, just wrapping up here, we see that, that numbers, uh, hospitalizations do continue to go up. And look at this. I mean, we've obviously surpassed uh, the first and second waves in terms of, uh, of hospitalizations throughout the country. So this is looking at a map of the United States where everything is dark red, which means uncontrolled spread. Um, there's only one that has caution warranted. That's Hawaii. And then you've got 50 states, uh, 49 states, including DC, that are an uncontrolled spread. And this is why we are considered a global hotspot. <laughs> you look at this map and it just says nothing but global hotspot. Um, looking at Louisiana uh, real quickly, uh, we added 2,500 to 2,542 cases and 40 deaths. Um, remember, this is a slide deck that I presented to the mayor and the mayor's office today. Uh, looking at Louisiana, looking at our parishes. Ed, there's no counties in Louisiana. We have parishes. It's it's, it's another word for county. Right. Yeah, I'm aware of that. Yep. Yeah. And so we have uh, every parish in the state is in a high incidence of, of cases, uh, unfortunately. Looking at uh, Louisiana, you can see our cases are going up significantly. Uh, 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 with a 26% uh, change over time. Deaths are going up a 32% increase and then hospitalizations are going up. And here we can see uh, mortality uh, creeping upwards, uh, almost reaching the points of what the second wave looked like. And then hospitalizations are very, very rapidly about to surpass the second wave and possibly go on par with the first wave as well. Uh, just wrapping up the Louisiana story, Looking at, uh, at COVID Act now, we are now 53 per 100,000 cases with an infection rate of 1.1 and a test positivity of 11%. Last week, that was 9.5. We are moving in the wrong direction. These are like the vital signs of the state. And these numbers right here, anything above 1.0 1 means exponential growth. And then the test positivity rate. Man, that needs to be below five or even three percent. So that we're not testing enough people, and the people we're testing are people who are already sick with COVID. That's what that test positivity looks like. And then here is uh, 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 they like it when I use their dashboard and not COVID Act now, because I'm presenting to the mayor's office. I use their dashboard. Um, there in the city of Orleans Parish. We are at 1.13, so again, we're in exponential growth, and then our test positivity is 5.2. So right now, we definitely have, uh, uh, we are in some worrisome uh, uh, position here uh, in, in, in Orleans, and so that's kind of what things look like there. 
uh, just some quick uh, studies before we do that. A any questions or are you guys good? Well, just one thing. I, I did have a chance to do a little, do, do a little math. The population of uh, the U.S. back in 1918 was 103.8 million. Right. And there were, what, 500,000 deaths from the uh, Spanish influenza? Right. So equivalently, we're about... We're a little. We're over three times that population now. Jeez. So, if we, if we were to see the equivalent of that, it'd be it'd be uh, one, one point five or one point six or seven million over over one and a half million. Wow. So I mean, for what that's right. Worth. No, I mean, I, I think that's a very good point. I mean, that it, I didn't even think about it from that perspective to even use it. I was just looking at the gross number just to see if we were surpassing. It didn't even occur to me to put it in a percentage relative to what the, what the U.S. population was at the time. So thank you, it's, a, it's an excellent point. Um, so let me just go over some really great studies that I thought were really interesting. This one uh, blew everyone away. Doc Grid, be prepared to be blown away. This was a study in North Korea in which they did an excellent job by using cell phone GPS data and closed circuit TV. And they found that one person got infected after being in a restaurant for five minutes from 20 feet away. What? What does that mean? So here's the story. So what they did is they got they got air engineers, right? So people who do air engineering, right? I didn't know it was a thing, but it is. And what they did is once they suspected this, they shut the restaurant down and they followed the air current. So they were able to measure the air currents. So here's your index patient right here. This was a person that was in from out of town, uh, stopped at a restaurant for a meeting uh, and uh, came down uh, downstairs from that meeting and had uh, had dinner with this person right here. This person was pre-symptomatic. They didn't know that they were sick with COVID at that point. But look at this. Look at this. The, 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 the virus got caught in an air current, right? And at 4.8 meters away, hit this person right here. Yep. And 6.5 meters, which is over, it's 21 feet, hit this person right here. And this person was only in the restaurant for five minutes. So this person was here. She was a, a, a young, uh, she was a, 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 a school, she was in high school. Uh, so in her late teens, um, and uh, she was the first person that ended up having COVID. The city had not had a case of COVID in several months. So they were surprised. So that's why they, they did all this extensive contact tracing. But what this study shows is that we have to look beyond this ridiculous notion of six feet, 15 minutes, because this is a perfect case study that shows that six feet, 15 minutes doesn't mean anything. Here you had a person that was 20 feet away, but was able to, and these two were only in the same room for five minutes. Oh, the last thing, how did I forget to tell you this? When they took the genetics of this virus, this virus, and this virus, they the were same. all exactly the same. So Ken, I would like you to send me this one offline because I, I had something special to do with this. Yeah, this is, uh, this is. Yeah, that, that, that is pretty astounding that they could figure that out. Right? Wow. It, yeah. They did like, a, they did an amazing job getting in there and, and figuring and figuring that out. So that's why it was an, an astounding study because they just, they did everything. They were even talking about, listen to this, they were even able to figure out the airflow by measuring how the chandeliers were swinging. So that was how wow. they were able to figure out what what the um, what the airflow actually was in the restaurant for that day. And when, when they, was what's that? This, when was this done? This was, this, this was published this week. Wow. So look at that. So five minutes, 20 feet away. So there was that. So uh, talking about math, I hate that I have to actually do these studies or I have to report these studies. This is another study oh, looking yeah. at whether or not masking uh, interfered with oxygenation, except here they used an elderly cohort. They looked at 25 people that were over the age of 65. They had them do nothing. They, and they were wearing a three-ply non-medical mask. They had them do nothing. They had them do their ordinary activities, and then they had them do nothing again. And guess what? When they wore a mask and when they didn't wear a mask, there was no difference. There was no decrease in oxygenation. Remember, oxygen, guys, that's an atom. And that atom is really small, right? These are molecules. These are little tiny things. So when they go right through the fiber of a mask, you know, uh, just as if it were – the 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 size of an atom looking at the, the the fibers of a mask is like looking at 
the difference between the edges of the Grand Canyon. That's how much space uh, they have to go. So when you're breathing in uh, and blowing out carbon dioxide, there is no problem. And again, this is yet another study having to show uh, people that the way that they think about masking is not necessarily correct. So, so Ed, don't get the impression that I don't take this this part, those studies seriously, but right. these drive me nuts because we've been fighting the same battle <laughs> against this whole carbon dioxide, oxygenation, if you wear a mask, that whole, food, and it's still here. It's still here. Like, right. let, let, me, let me ask you guys, you, you guys both, uh, are on board with with uh, Dr. Fauci for the most part, right? You agree with him usually? Oh, okay, so, so, just, so just out, out yesterday, I think it was, um, he says we could approach herd immunity by summer's end and normality that is close to where we were before by the end of 2021. You think he's right? I've been saying December next year. Okay. I've been saying I've been saying we'll probably start to see some resumption of life as we know it probably in the fall, like we'll still be masked. Like yeah. we'll still be like, there won't be like big concerts. Like, I don't think we're gonna see, we may see like a little mini Mardi Gras in the fall. Uh, and I'm not breaking any news or anything. This is just my, 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 okay. opinion. right. It's my opinion. Uh, but I, can you, we, do, can you do Mardi Gras by zoom? I don't know. <laughs> Change your thing Maybe we could. Yeah. Now that you put the idea out there. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be credited with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, but I would imagine that probably by summer of 2022, we'll probably see life more as we know it. I think that, you know, I, I bet you will see a Jazz Fest 2022. I bet you see we'll see a French Quarter Fest. I bet you it'll be smaller. I bet you people, like, I'll never go out in a group of people without wearing a mask. Like, so with, with, this getting, with this getting worse, I mean, this is going to get worse over the winter, though. No, it's going to get worse in the next few weeks. It's going to get. Yeah. Oh, so, so, what, so, what, so what does that portend for the uh, Saints in the Super Bowl? Ah, that it, it, it will be it'll, it'll be well watched. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I'm actually surprised that the NFL has been able to get away with what it's been oh, able to do Ed, when you look oh, with, with, with baseball. I mean, baseball is pretty much a non-event. Ed, you're you're tapping on the door of a rabbit hole. I don't know if you want to send us down because we will. Oh, we stood very hard against the prospect. So uh, I was a walk-on at Notre Dame, talked to the team. Um, everyone knows I'm a Saints fan. I've said it on television a million times back in the beginning. There's, we should not be playing a, a, a collision sport when you're social distancing the fans and you want to watch the players crash into each other during a pandemic. We should not. I'm sorry, we should not, but we are anyway. So if that's what's going to happen, our job is to make sure that we're trying to a explain what's happening and do it in the safest way possible and describe what's going on. But I mean, I, I never realized the, in, the 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 gravity that the prospect of not having football would have on the morale of an entire country. Like it's just, it's not you can't explain it. I I, I remember like in the very beginning when we were having these football conversations. Oh. And, uh, do you remember? And I was like, and I was talking with the senior VP. We were working on projects together at Oshner for the mayor. And I was like, what is wrong with all this football? Why does the high schools insist on football? Because we were being challenged. How can we make high school football safe? And we're like, we can't. Just do a football season. Yeah. And Leo, he's like, you don't understand. You're not from the South. Uh, football is. Or the, mid or the Midwest. Uh, you know, I'm like, I'm a musician. I would I run a radio station. I would love to see music. You don't see me complaining out there all the time about yeah. music. You know, like I don't get the football. Yeah. I don't know. If, I, Ed, I don't know if you saw the game where they put a. Uh, we we had a. Who were we playing? Was it the Colts? What was they? Where they they pulled this kid, some dude who was on the practice squad, and they made him play quarterback. No, and, that was no, that was Denver. Well, you know, yeah, about yeah. That. They were, didn't they run out of quarterbacks? They ran out of quarterbacks. And this kid, I mean, you know, you feel bad for him. He did the best he could. I mean, he was a practice player. Right. He did not travel when all the years started. Wait, what? Who, 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 who play quarterback? Uh, college? <laughs> That'd be like getting Griggs to play quarterback. True. Right. <laughs> well, at, the, at, the risk, at the risk of never getting invited back on your show, Mark Allen, I am a Tom Brady fan. That's that, yeah. fine. Right. I'm a <laughs> Cut his mic. Cut his, cut his mic. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. It was nice having you on our show. Um, listen, let me just go through this because I want to show you guys some other really important slides. This is another study just looking at post-COVID syndrome or what people call long haulers. Um, 
What was interesting about this is that just another study, what we're, what's, what, what's happening now and what's coming from this essentially is this, is that, that, the, that people who experience, these are not hospitalized folks, people who experience COVID and get a lot of symptoms or they're very symptomatic when they first get their COVID infection, about 10 to 20% of those people are likely to experience uh, this so-called post-COVID syndrome or what people refer to as long haulers. They, a majority of folks report a continued shortness of breath about six months out, continued loss uh, or disturbance of smell and taste. And then of course, there's all the other symptoms of fatigue and headaches and mental fogginess. But it looks like what we're gonna be seeing now is about 10 to 20% of those people who have more severe sim symptoms are likely to be people who develop post-COVID uh, syndrome. Um, I'm gonna skip this study here. This is a little bit more technical. This study just basically in summary, if you are symptomatic and you get a test for a PCR test and it's negative, you should get another test about seven to 10 days later. Uh, and so this was more for the clinicians. Um, so let's talk about the vaccines. So this is what the big stories are. This was the AstraZeneca vaccine, the so-called vaccine uh, that was being made out of Oxford. The data, the data finally dropped on Tuesday and it basically showed a 70% efficacy after two doses. Uh, and you can see here, this line shows that it had some decent protection, whereas the placebo had far more cases of COVID-19. Uh, there was one little hiccup here. They basically took four different uh, countries that did it. The, when the UK did theirs, they used half of a dose of the first vaccine that's referred to as the prime. Um, and then for some reason, they got a much better outcome of 90%. This is yet still to be confirmed. Um, I, I am a little hesitant about that. And I definitely want to see more data uh, about that. Doc, Griggs, wouldn't you love every study that came out that came out with its own PDF, like it, its own <laughs> infographic like this? It's this perfect infographic. So on Tuesday, the Pfizer vaccine dropped uh, as well. This is the mRNA vaccine. We've talked about mRNA vaccines at uh, so many times. Essentially, you get a little messenger RNA. It gets put into your, your muscle cells. The muscles, the mRNA goes inside the cell and it finds the ribosome, which is like the 3D printer of your body. And your own body begins to, pop, to knock out the antigen. So you're not being injected with an antigen. Your body makes the antigen. It's the spike protein. And then you get uh, immunized. Your own body then uh, creates an immunity to this. And what this showed was remarkable. Uh, what it showed was that there was a, a 95% um, that there was a 95% uh, efficacy. In other words, if you had the vaccine, you, uh, if you had the vaccine and you were exposed to COVID, it protected you 95% of the time. It's important for us to recognize two very important things is that you are going to get a reaction from it, okay? So you will get a reaction and that reaction is more likely to be uh, a little bit more uh, uh, pronounced after the second dose. And those were pain, redness at the site, systemic reactions like fever, headaches, and myalgia. So 95, this is a tremendous, uh, I, we always said we want to wait for the data to drop. We want the data to drop. The data dropped. And this has been amazing. But you, you really think and there's enough data out yet? There's, still, there's already enough data? I think there's enough data. I mean, obviously, Ed, we would like to see a little bit more in the form of safety data. And usually we see that in about six months or so. But at, you know, at this point, I, I trust the... I trust the mechanism by the vaccine work. Um, hey, Eric, is that you? Is that you or? I mean, there's something that, yeah, there's something that's coming through. Is, is, is there has there ever been a vaccine that has moved this quickly? And is that a good thing? Um, there's <laughs> that we're going to get to that in a second. Wait, because <laughs> Wait, I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a biography on the on the on the person who invented this vaccine. Uh, she's a remarkable person, but there has not been a vaccine that's moved this quickly because the technology is brand new. So the technology from this vaccine actually came from the uh, came from the mind of this brilliant young scientist, uh, and her name is uh, Kizmikia Corbet. She goes by Kizzy by short. She's 34 years old now. She was 29 when she got her job with the NIH. And she came to them with this idea of using mRNA as a uh, as a technology uh, to uh, 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 for vaccines. 
because the code can be made much quicker. You Once you know what the, the virus is, you can actually create a code for the antigen. Uh, and, uh, and here she is at 34 years old, uh, now uh, what I refer to as the newest American hero. And I want you guys, and, and she immediately went to work on coronavirus. So she was, and that's the other thing, Ed, was that right person, right time, right? She was already at the NIH, she was already working on this, and she was working on coronavirus. So when the coronavirus uh, pandemic hit, she already had everything in, in her hands. And so she led the Moderna team uh, do, she led the Moderna team. And, and Ed, just to kind of remind you that if you look at the M and the RNA of Moderna, that was why they named it uh, Moderna. But it, it's her humble quotes, this amazing quote that she said here that I wanted to share with you. She says, to be living in this moment where I've had the opportunity to work on something that has eminent global importance, it's just surreal, it's just a surreal moment for me. So I just think that that's just very, uh, that's just right. amazing. Uh, and it's an amazing story. Uh, and so uh, I, do I, do I, I, do I trust the vaccine? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. I will, I will be in the front of the line. Uh, I think Doc Griggs, are, are you going to be um, getting it on Monday or yeah. you on Monday? Yeah. Well, whatever day we're doing it, I'm doing it. Okay. There, um, I think it'd be really, really, it'd be really cool if in like the like like in uh, in Great Britain the second person to get vaccinated was like William, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Yeah. Why, why can't we have somebody named George Washington be like the first person to get vaccinated here, so, and then maybe the second can be uh, somebody named Tom Brady? I don't know. We need to coordinate that with the television station because they want to do it as publicly as possible. Yeah, let's let's do it. And I like I said, and I'm, I'm kidding about that. I, I'm gonna, and yeah, I would yeah. be happy to wear my Elvis. Uh, uh, <laughs> Elvi, uh, just like Elvis, Elvi, you know, do you know the story about how he did it for the uh, polio vaccine? Oh, in the 1950s, polio vaccine was very, very low uptick. Uh, when Elvis got, uh, he got publicly vaccinated live on, on, uh, on TV, uh, within six months, there was an 80%, uh, before it, it was less than 1%. After Elvis. Well, so, so what I want you to do is I want you to wear your Elvis costume and then the moment after you get the shot, I want you to look at the camera and say, thank you very much. There you go. That, of course. Of course. That's what we're going to do. I, I want to hear him sing Hound Dog after that. <laughs> well, that's what he actually, so after he got his shot, he made his first appearance on Ed Sullivan singing Hound Dog. No, really? Really? Oh, wow. What a guess. Okay. <laughs> that's hilarious. He, they actually, he was at the TV studio. He got his polio vaccine. And then he went over and did Ed Sullivan's show. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, guys, we have to wrap up. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, Ed Fallon is a recovering politician. Hopefully, <laughs> maybe, 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 I don't know, when the cows come home, he may run again. Uh, climate activist and also talk show host of the Fallon Forum. He's based out of Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it is a syndicated radio program. We do run it on WHIV here. You can find more information about him at FallonForum.com. And thank you so much for, for being on air with us today. Great to be here. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yep. Thank you. Eric, thank you. Thank you, Mark Allen. We love you. We love our our, our noise filter family. You guys all Health is a human right. Health is a human right. right. We love you guys. Get your flu shots. <laughs>